Welcome to our fourth session of our 2021 Field to Fork webinar series. My name is Julie Garden Robinson, and I'm a food and nutrition specialist with NDSU Extension, and I will be your host for today's webinar. As you can see, our upcoming webinars are featuring two more horticulture experts. We have Tom Kelb, who is a specialist located in Bismarck, and our University of Minnesota colleague, Randy Nelson. We certainly hope that you join us for the entire series of 10 webinars, whether you're watching them live or you are watching the archived versions. Several have already been posted on our Field to Fork site. We are using the Zoom webinar function this year, and you will all be in listening mode today without cameras or microphones, but people who are watching this live will be able to ask questions in the chat box. So as you listen to Esther today, please go ahead and type your, the, your questions in the chat, and I will pose those questions to our speaker after her presentation. And next, I have a special request for all viewers of the live talk and any of the archives to maintain our funding sources and offer these types of programs in the future, I ask that you take the very short survey that will land in your email inbox shortly after today's talk. We will have random prize drawings, so you may receive a prize in the mail if you win. And after submitting your survey, you will be re redirected to a second survey, and that's where you can enter your name and mailing address. I have two acknowledgements today. First, to the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service for our Field to Fork funding, which has provided lots of materials for all of our viewers on our website. And we also have a contribution from Purdue University through a grant from the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And we certainly thank all of these entities for their support. Well, now it's time for our featured speaker, and I'm very pleased to introduce Esther McGinnis, an associate professor and NDSU horticulturalist. Dr. Esther McGinnis is the NDSU Extension Horticulture Specialist and Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences. In addition to managing the NDSU Extension Master Gardener Program, Esther conducts research in the areas of native and ornamental plants for rain gardens, pollinator gardens, and home landscape use. Her graduate students have also engaged in high tunnel production research. So thank you, Esther, and it's all yours. Thank you, Julie, and thank you for asking me to be a part of Field to Fork. Um, so a big hello to everybody out there. We've got a gorgeous day. I'm just honored that you are um, participating in this webinar today instead of being outdoors. So thank you for that. Um, before I begin my presentation, um, I'm going to share with you our NDSU non-discrimination statement. Um, NDSU does not discriminate in its programs or activities on the basis of protected classes. Um, now today, um, I'm going to be talking about cut flowers, and um, I'm really going to be wearing a different hat. So we wear different hats. Um, I'm a horticulture extension specialist, but in addition, I have a research appointment, and um, as part of that, I advise grad students and you know write grants and conduct research. So I'm going to be talking about research today instead of um, instead of my normal extension talk. And um, this is exciting because um, it's very much a collaborative team effort. So Harleen Hatterman Valenti and I co-advised two graduate students. We advised Jacob Clusa, and I'm going to be you know, talking about his research with cut flowers today. We also co-advised Kyla Splickle, and she did her research on uh, vegetable cultivar trials. Now the two helped each other out because we produced, we replicated the trials, one in Williston and one in Absaraka. So very much a team effort between our master's students. And I'm happy to report that they did in fact um, successfully defend their, their master's thesis and um, um, have gone on to bigger and better things. Uh, also want to thank the North Dakota Specialty Crop Block Grant for funding our research, um, and, and that's very much on display here today. 
Um, so I guess I just, I'm gonna ask um, people to respond in the chat box. Um, are there any, any individuals that are currently producing uh, cut flowers? So I'll ask Ju uh, Julie to take a look in the chat box and see if we've got people that are producing cut flowers. You have a couple so far. Good, good. Okay, and then, then I'll ask, are there any individuals out there that are producing in high tunnels that are on the, the webinar today? So I'm seeing um, mostly field grown, yes. We're getting our first high tunnel in a couple months. Yes, yes, we have them. So we definitely have several. That's terrific. I mean, that's really exciting to me to see that that we've got more and more individuals that are growing in high tunnels. You know, if there's ever a state that um, could benefit from high tunnels, it's definitely North Dakota and then, of course, our neighboring states, too. Well, for those of you that have not engaged in high tunnel production, um, I'm just going to briefly define it and show you a few slides on how these are constructed before I launch into cut flower production. So high tunnels are essentially inexpensive, unheated greenhouses. Um, and they are covered in plastic, you know, sometimes up to two layers of plastic. And the whole purpose of high tunnels is to, in fact, um, e extend the season. So what we have is we have the sun that's beating down on these high tunnels, and they passively trap the heat in the high tunnels, and they warm the soil. So um, most high tunnel producers can get at least uh, a month's worth of season extension in the spring and then another month in the fall, um, you know, which puts us at a competitive advantage when we're selling at farmers markets, particularly if we can bring, you know, crops to market a month earlier than out in the field. But using more specialized technology, say, for example, Heat, uh, heat cables or using uh, thermal blankets and low tunnels, we can in fact go much, much later into the season. And we currently have producers in North Dakota that are able to overwinter uh, select crops. Um, but so far, we're just going to talk about producing cut flowers um, during the spring, summer, and fall season today. Um, so I'll show you a few slides. We did have a high tunnel construction field day um, and we had a number of individuals, maybe even some that are on the webinar today that participated in this. Um, we purchased our kit from Rimmel and it's a fairly large high tunnel. It's 30 feet wide by 96 feet long. And by having a high tunnel that wide and that long, um, the center part of the high tunnel does not freeze during the winter. Um, one nice thing about this kit is that we've got six foot side walls. This allows people to work on the edges of the high tunnel and not have to bend over. Although that's not a problem for me. If you know me, I'm not exactly the tallest of, of people. Um, we also have a, a sloped Gothic roof. And that's very important because we want that snow to, instead of building up on that fragile plastic, we want it to just slide right off. And then for our end walls, it's, it's framed in timber. Although there are options, if you want one that's a little prettier, you can spring for uh, polycarbonate end walls. Um, so just some, some, some photos as we built the high tunnel. Uh, I think we've got Harleen here up on a ladder. Um, but with this kit, all the holes were pre-drilled and we just bolted the pieces together and this came together quite quickly. Um, fortunately, one of our grad students actually had a degree in construction management, and she, she did an absolute fabulous, fabulous job of keeping us on track. Um, now, to the west here, you can see we've got a windbreak to protect the high tunnel, and that's really important. So I mentioned that this is covered in, in plastic, and that plastic is pretty darn expensive. So we don't want a storm to come through and, and rip the plastic. So nice to have the windbreak there. But also that, that, that windbreak is far enough that it's not shading the high tunnel. So we're walking a little bit of a line there. And here you can see that, um, that my students, um, Kyla and Jacob are um, bolting together um, the, the little footboard here to keep out um, some of the larger rodents and to add a little bit of strength to the high tunnel. Um, now here, Here's one of the finished high tunnels. This is the high tunnel out in Williston. 
And this is after, you know, the plastic has been installed. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say a word on installing the plastic. You don't want to do this on a windy day. Um, you will be carried away. I can guarantee that. So pick a nice calm day to stretch the plastic. Um, it, it, that's not an easy process. Uh, other things to note here, we've got large doors to permit machinery to enter. We've got um, end, end vents here. And then we've got um, roll up side walls, which um, we automated. And it's very important in summer to have, you know, venting going on because we don't want there to be heat delays for the crops. All right. So that was just a little word on, you know, the purposes of high tunnels and to give you a snapshot of how they're put together. Um, we really kind of did it a little bit like in a, uh, like they used to build old barns as far as, you know, coming together as a community. Uh, all right, so now we're gonna talk about our research trials. We had two trials side by side at each location. We grew cut flowers in the high tunnel and then we grew a separate trial out in the field right adjacent to the high tunnel so we could see, you know, they're, they're growing in the same soils, um, using the same, the same cultivars and treatments, but we wanted to see if we could um, detect a difference in yield and quality of our cut flowers. So as I mentioned, this was conducted in two separate locations. One was on the eastern side of the state in Absaraka. And Absaraka is about 40 miles west of Fargo. Um, and then our western site was northwest of Williston at the Williston Research Extension Center in Nesson Valley. So a little word about the cut flower economy. And I, I think this is going to surprise you a little bit. Um, cut flowers are primarily an international crop. Um, so we imported 1.4 billion in cut flowers in 2016. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, in that year, 90% of the cut flowers that were sold, you know, whether through the grocery store, you know, through florists, came from international sources. Um, we only grow 10% of our domestic flowers. And, and this, kind of, this kind of rubs me the wrong way. I like to see a lot of local production. Um, so that was you know, part of the thinking that went into this project. Um, but just to give you an idea, you know, the roses, the carnations, um, the florist chrysanthemums, the alstroemeria, also known as Peru Peruvian lily, are largely produced in Colombia and Ecuador. And they have a competitive advantage um, you know, land costs are low in those countries, you know, and throughout Central and South America. Labor costs are just a tiny fraction of what they are in the United States. Um, they're growing outdoors in mild climates, so they're not having to expend much for energy. And then, and then they're probably subsidized by their, by their governments too. So you may be asking, how can we compete with the global flower economy, you know, when we're at a disadvantage as far as land and labor costs? Well, um, our, our answer is to focus on specialty cut flowers. So specialty cut flowers are those, some of them will sell at a premium, um, but other cut flowers that are, are specialty, um, they're not grown in other countries because they may have very complex growing requirements. So they're harder to grow and they just don't want to deal with it. Now there are other cut flowers that may be easier to grow, but then they don't withstand transport and shipping. You know, as you can imagine, these cut flowers that are produced in other countries, you know, they're, they're, they're thrown into boxes and shipped by airplane to the United States. And that shipment is not maybe harder on some species than others. Well, we chose to work with three different flowers, um, which we consider to be specialty uh, cut flowers. First is snapdragon. And snapdragon, I mean, we, we do see that produced um, more frequently for farmers markets and such, but Snapdragon is notoriously difficult to ship. And I'll, I'll show you um, in a few slides, you know, why that is. Um, Dahlia is also difficult to ship. Uh, and then we chose Lysianthus. 
Now, Lysianthus, you know, not so bad as far as shipment, but it is a bear, an absolute bear to grow. It's just so slow. Um, so speaking of snapdragons, we tested two different cultivars. Um, we tested rocket mix and rocket mix um, would be the pastel flowers that you see in the photos. And then Potomac white um, has the beautiful white flowers. Now these are, are definitely cultivars that are, are grown for the florist market as opposed to being bedding plants. Cause we do grow snapdragons uh, to be landscape plants too. But these were chosen because you know they have that tall spire of flowers. Um, we also chose it because this has, these have been demonstrated to be good field crops, but we didn't know how well would these do in the high tunnel? Would there be a difference? Um, so our snapdragons uh, are very popular because you know they have that vertical interest. They draw the eye upward in the bouquet. Um, so they're um, they're very much appreciated for giving architecture and shape to a bouquet. Um, snapdragons, we really wanted to try because they're a cool season crop. Um, we wanted to see, you know, how how early can we get them into the field um, and, and into the high tunnel and still produce a crop. We do know that if snapdragons are properly acclimated, that they can take a frost. They can take temperatures as low as 25 to 28 degrees Fahrenheit. But, but the key term there is acclimated. So we want to toughen up or harden up our snapdragons before they go out into the field or to the high tunnel. And the reason for this is, you know, imagine you are starting your snapdragons, you may be starting them indoors, um, you, may be, you may be starting the seed in a greenhouse. So at that point, you're really pampering the plants. And can you imagine the shock of after being pampered, you know, at 70 degrees, all of a sudden you toss them outdoors and plant them either into the high tunnel or, or the soil. Um, with the snapdragons and, and with all the crops that we grew, it was very important to carefully acclimate them. So put them out for a few, uh, for a couple hours the first day. Um, and then each day, just gradually introduce them to spring temperatures a little bit more, a little bit more, you know, first during the day hours. And then eventually, you know, after about a week, a week and a half, they can be outside all night. Um, but that's, that's important first and foremost. Um, if you're starting your plants indoors, got to acclimate them. Um, other things we know about snapdragons are probably not the best crop when you have hot temperatures that reduces their quality, it reduces the stem length. It also reduces um, the caliper or strength of the stem. And then uh, snapdragons need high light intensity. We worked with two different Dahlia cultivars. Um, aren't they gorgeous? Um, the one on the left is Karma Chocolate. And <clears throat> Karma Chocolate has that lovely burgundy color. And then um, the leaves have kind of a bronze bronze effect to them. So very attractive, the whole plant's attractive in the landscape. Um, on the right is Karma Irene. And Irene has more of a, an orangish reddish color to it with more of the standard green foliage. But unlike, um, unlike snapdragons, Dahlia cultivars tend to be more of a high value cut flower. These are cut flowers that are prized in the, the floral trade. And um, so these command more of a premium than the snapdragons. <clears throat> With our dahlias, they're also difficult to ship. So they're less likely to be grown internationally and then flown. Um, flown into the United States. And that's because with our dahlias, they need to be shipped in water. Um, you can't just throw them in a box and then rehydrate them when they get there like you can with some other plants. With dahlias, they need to be shipped in water and that just adds to the logistics of, of shipping them. So it's better to grow these in the United States so that they, um, and locally, so um, they can be shipped just a short distance. Now, unlike snapdragons, Dahlias are a warm season crop, um, and then they do better in midsummer. Um, so we wanted to see what happens if we plant dahlias at the same time as snapdragons. Will they be able to take it? Um, now dahlias, uh, you can certainly buy buy in dahlias and buy in their tuberous roots. Um, you can you can start them from seed, and then there are also stem cuttings that are available. Um, 
Now with dahlias, they can also be grown as a perennial in warmer climates, um, like zones you know, seven through 10. The third crop we worked with was Lysianthus. And I wish I had a better picture. This is the only picture I took of Lysianthus. Um, and this is after they're already really open. Um, but we worked with three cultivars, Mariachi Misty Blue, Echo Blue, and ABC2 Blue. Um, now I, I found this picture, this isn't our picture, but I found this, this photo just to show you, you know, how, how this has really become a prized flower. Um, it, it does look a lot like roses before it opens up fully. Um, it comes in colors that would not be traditional for roses. Um, so very highly prized in the floral industry. It's very expensive and very prized by the wedding industry. So you can see we're working with crops that, that run the gamut, you know, as far as, you know, price and, and, and growing requirements. Now with Lysianthus, um, it's, it's from the genus Eustoma. This is a cool season crop. And I'd say it's more of, more of a cool, cool season crop almost than snapdragon. Um, it al it's also native to the United States. Um, it's grown in the, in, in the Southwest. It's, it's native to the Southwest. Um, now, as I mentioned, this is a bear to grow. It's very slow to grow from seeds. So you have to be very patient. Um, Barb Lashkowitz, our campus, uh, garden manager does start Lysianthus every year in the greenhouse. I think she starts them like the end of January um, with the hopes of planting them out Memorial Day weekend. So very slow to, to come from seed, takes at least three months, if not more, to grow three to grow three to five leaves. So this is one that's really difficult to grow. We did not start um, Lysianthus from seed for this experiment. We didn't have the time. Um, we, we purchased in plugs, which made it a whole lot easier. Um, one thing to know, if you are starting this from seed, there are two stages. You've got the seedling stage where you're just trying to grow enough leaves that you have uh, enough support to um, to produce flowers. And during that point in time, you have to grow, grow them at cool temperatures, night temperatures at um, 70 and above will ruin the crop at that stage. So you have to grow them uh, on the cool side. And then the second stage is the bolting stage where they will send up their flowers. Um, and even at that point, night temperatures um, it can be a little bit higher. You know, the, the optimal range is 65 to 70. If it goes too high, um, it, it then will cut back on flower production. So a little bit tougher to grow. You know, here are our Lysianthus plants going into the ground for the trial. You can see they're, they're, really, they're really tiny compared to the snapdragons on, on the left-hand side. All right, so here's the trial set up in the high tunnel. So we've got two trials going on within the high tunnel. We have uh, Kyla Splickle's vegetable variety or cultivar trial on the far end, and then the flower trial is on the close end. Now you can see that we've got plastic walkways, and then we've got three, um, three rows of drip line going down the center. Um, now, um, We've got things spaced here um, to try and optimize it. Um, we know that with our dahlias, we need a lot more room than we need for our snapdragons and for our lysianthus. One thing to keep in mind with cut flowers is um, it's very important to keep them upright. I know some individuals do stake their flowers, but that's really labor intensive. Instead, we use netting. Um, very important, particularly for our snapdragons. With our snapdragons, they are what we call gravitropic. Um, gravitropic means that, you know, if, if the stems are bending over, they will sag and bend um, and they'll never straighten up again. So that would make it very difficult to, in fact, um, to sell them or for them to be marketable. Um, but this netting was just really, really easy way to keep the cut flowers upright, you know, very inexpensive and, and didn't require much labor. Um, so here's the outdoor trial. This is much later in the season when you can see that our dahlias are the predominant crop. All right, 
So you may be asking, how did we standardize our planting dates? You know, obviously going to be much cooler outdoors than it is in the high tunnel. Um, can, did you plant on the same date or how did you standardize that? Well, for our experiment, we decided to rely upon the soil temperature. So we chose two soil temperatures, 13 degrees Celsius, which is roughly 55 degrees Fahrenheit, and then 18 degrees Celsius, which is about 64 degrees. So we wanted to use that as our, as our date for planting. Now, if you remember, um, we, we um, built the high tunnels um, in spring of 2016. So this meant that our high tunnels were not up for as long as we would have liked um, since they were built at the end of April. Um, and in fact, the soil temperature did not warm within the high tunnel to 13 degrees until May 20th. And then it reached 18 degrees Celsius by May 30th. So not much different from when we planted in the field. So we got about five days difference here in, in 2016. Um, for the 13 degrees and it looks like um, eight or nine days uh, later to reach the 18 degrees Celsius temperature in the field. But once we got to 2017, remember the high tunnel is already in place and was able to optimize um, the solar energy. So in 2017 in Absaraka, we were able to plant um, our first our first crop on April 24th, when the soil temperature reached 13 degrees Celsius, and then um, the second planting date was May 6th. So you can see, you know, side by side, that's that's part of where the season extension is coming in. The soil temperature warms up a lot faster in the high tunnel. And then when we look at um, the planting dates in the field adjacent to the Absaraka High Tunnel. We planted the first planting on May 17th and the second planting on May 29th. Um, and then we did we did the similar system out in Absaraka. I'm sorry, Williston. All right, so I'm going to show you maybe a half dozen slides showing you our data. So we're going to pretend that we're researchers and I'm going to explain uh, statistics just a little bit. Um, so we collected um, a, a ton of data. I'm just going to show you our yield data, the average number of flower stems produced per square meter. So I'm going to show you some slides on our field production and some on our high tunnel. And I highlighted that in yellow to make it a little clearer. Um, now going across the bottom of the slide, we've got 16A and 17A standing for the years and the location. So 2016 Absaraka, 2017 Absaraka, and then 2016 and 2017 Williston. One thing I need to explain is that when you're looking at statistical data, um, differences between cultivars or treatments are not uh, significant from a statistical point of view unless the letters are different. If you have letters that are overlapping, that's not considered um, a research effect. It's not considered significant. So in 2016 and 2017, we had we were growing two cultivars. The blue would be Potomac White and the orange would be Rocket Mix. So two cultivars of Snapdragons. Um, while there's some differences between the two cultivars, it's not significant from a statistical point of view in, in Absaraka. But we get out to Williston, huge difference, and the difference is large enough to be statistically significant. So that's all I'm going to talk about statistics. Just know that we had much bigger differences and significant differences out in Williston. So one thing I want to hammer home with this slide is that if you're going to be engaging in cut flower production, there will be differences for you based on your location. So we saw differences from one side of the state to the other side of the state. Um, so good to do some trialing of your own in your own soil and in your own location because it may be different. And it's good to compare cultivars. Here we saw out in the field that Potomac White um, produced, you know, maybe one third to one half of what Rocket Mix did out in Williston. So good information to know. Um, in the next slide, it's showing you there was a difference 
with the two cultivars based on soil planting temperature. Um, so Potomac White, there was no difference. Um, regardless of what date you put them out, it was about the same yield for Snapdragon. <clears throat> Over on the right-hand side, it, it, it showed that with Snapdragon, the earlier you got them in, the larger the yield was. Um, so planting at 13 degrees out in the field with the soil temperature versus 18 degrees was beneficial and we had more stems that were produced um, at the 13 degree temperature versus the later planting. So, you know, keep these figures in mind, you know, we've had here a range of somewhere from 50 to 193. Now this is, these are um, the average number of Snapdragon stems produced in the high tunnel. So in the high tunnel, much, much larger figures, you know, we're breaking 300 in 2016 Absaraka. Um, we did not see any differences based on soil temperature planting date, which was interesting in the high tunnel. Um, but we saw some differences based on location. Um, 2016, Williston had a lower yield than the two, um, the two years in Absaraka in 2017, Williston. You know, there's, there's definitely going to be some variability based on year. There could have been, you know, differences in temperature in 2016, Williston. Um, or it could be the fact that we've got different people growing in Williston versus in Absaraka. We did notice a cultivar difference in the high tunnel. Rocket mix produced 280 stems on average versus Potomac white, which produced 202 stems. Um, so what we're noticing, we're noticing cultivar differences, um, both in the field and in the high tunnel, and we're noticing much higher production in the high tunnel. Now going to Dahlia, um, so we've got kind of the same setup here, average number of Dahlia stems per square meter in the field. With Dahlia, we had chocolate, remember the burgundy colored flower, and then we had Irene, which was more orangey. Um, so in three of the locations, we did see a cultivar difference. We saw that Irene produced uh, significantly more stems on average than, than chocolate did. Um, for a 2017 Absaraka and both years in Williston. We did see differences for planting date, but once again, it was cultivar specific. Chocolate, it didn't matter when you planted it, whether it was at um, 13 degrees Celsius versus 18 degrees. And then with Irene, we got a better yield planting at the 13 degree temperature for the soil versus 18 degrees. Now this is out in the field. This is something we didn't expect because this is a warm season crop. We thought that the later planting would be beneficial. So that's something we learned. Okay, so keep in mind, you know, kind of the range here for uh, number of dahlia stems, we're looking at maybe eight to, eight to 14 on average. Now compare this with our yields in the high tunnel. Um, so a lot, lot higher number of dahlia stems per square meter in the high tunnel, you know, 30 to 40. One thing I want you to notice is we had differences between 2016 and 2017. And I, I would say this is because there was a, a big learning curve with growing dahlia. When dahlia came in, um, it got infected with powdery mildew almost immediately. So we fought powdery mildew um, in both locations in 2016 and never really got a handle on it. And that was detrimental both out in the field and in the high tunnel. Um, but I mean, this, this is something that happens when you start a new crop. In 2017, we were prepared. We had, um, we made sure to have sulfur burners. Sulfur is very good at preventing powdery mildew. Um, and we're able to get a higher yield, statistically significant higher yield in 2017. Um, so, so that's just kind of good to know. Now we've got lots of other data. I'm not gonna bore you with it. We collected data on stem caliper because we don't want the stems to be too, too flimsy. And then we also collected data on stem height. Now with our dahlias, um, we got much better caliper and stem height in 2017, largely because the plants were healthier and not contending with powdery mildew. Um, and then with, 
We're going to talk about Lysianthus. I'm not going to show you the data from Lysianthus because it was kind of, um, it, it's not as clear cut. But the one thing we noticed with Lysianthus, or we noticed two things with Lysianthus. Um, they re it really does not like warm temperatures. Um, we had a number of plants that did not bloom because, you know, once the warm temperatures came, they just kind of quit. So with Lysianthus, growing them cooler is better. You know, I would like to have done a trial where we started maybe, you know, some temperatures started growing these at 10 degrees Celsius or maybe even 8 degrees Celsius in, to see how that worked. Um, the other thing we noticed is that I don't think it's really possible to grow Lysianthus out in the field and have a quality product. And that's because with Lysianthus, if raindrops fall on it, um, it's going to leave a stain. The raindrops ruin the paddles by leaving, leaving a little droplet. Um, now in the high tunnel, protected from the rain and we watered underneath. So there were no water droplets. Um, but you know, these things that you learn, it wasn't necessarily captured by statistics, but just looking at them, we know that Lysianthus is going to produce a much higher quality product if we grow them in a protected environment and don't let, let rain or water droplets fall on them. All right, so let's talk about the potential for high tunnel crops uh, for North Dakota. As I mentioned, you know, most cut flowers are produced in Central and South America. Um, it was really, really sad to hear that not a single major carnation producer is left in the United States. Now, I'm not necessarily a big fan of carnations, but if you think about the number of carnations that have to be produced in other countries and then flown to the United States, I mean, that's just huge, um, a huge amount of fuel that is consumed in, in doing that. So I'd like to see us bring back flower production to the United States. I think that would be a good thing and to be able to produce locally. Um, this can help diversify our high tunnel crops. <clears throat> We've discovered the hard way that if we grow tomatoes in high tunnel crops over and over again, you know, we end up with problems with viruses. There are a lot of different tomato viruses out there and they persist from year to year in the soil, you know, on the debris, you know, the root tissue that's left in the soil, and they take they take time um, to die out. So it's good for us if we can rotate different crops through the high tunnel, and I'm hoping that high tunnel cut flowers can be one of them. You know, potential markets could include our farmers markets. We're starting to see more CSAs or community supported agriculture subscriptions out there. Um, I think people would be thrilled to get a weekly bouquet of flowers. And then of course it helps to, uh, to make connections with wholesale florists and even retail florists in your area. I know that North Dakotans do like to sell local products. They like, they see that as a growing, uh, see that as uh, a great promotional thing. Um, one thing we, we were not able to do is to do a market analysis. Um, when we started the project, we had Glenn Muskie on board and then he retired. Good for him, bad for us though. Um, we, we were not able to fill that position due to budget cuts. Um, so we didn't do a market analysis of you know, what the costs are and, <clears throat> and how, how competitive these crops could be. So I'd like to see that done in the future. And then we learned that the high tunnel is a great protected environment for protecting the flowers from wind and rain. So what are our recommendations? You know, considering we don't have a market analysis and that considering that research is just really in its infant stages here in the North Country, start small. You know, whether you're doing this in the high tunnel or out in the field, start small, don't invest too much the first year because you're gonna be learning how to grow these crops. They're harder than you realize. Um, <clears throat> so learn and research the growing requirements for each genus um, that you plant. So there are different growing requirements, you know, cool season, warm season crops. We've got others, you know, that have different you know, different pruning requirements. We have others that some of them, are they, are the flowers initiated under short day length or long day length or are they day neutral? All good to know. 
and then test different cultivars of each genus on your property so that you may discover and keep records. Are there differences? Um, and, and you might be surprised. And trial different planting dates using soil temperature as your guide. You know, see how early can you go? Now there's gonna be variation between years. I mean, you know, we have late springs and early springs and such, but keep records because I mean, this is something you're gonna learn as we go forward. And then do the re research on potential pests, you know, both diseases and insects. Um, so I talked about powdery mildew being a problem. I mean, it, it was a huge problem and cut into our yields. Um, you know, research that before you go into it so that you can be ready to treat. Um, same with insects and, and mites. We had a problem with spider mites and that was pretty problematic for the first year. And that's not something you probably wouldn't have spider mites in a field setting. It, it tends to be more in a high tunnel when you've got hot temperatures and dry conditions um, that you see spider mites. Now, the second year, we were better able to get a handle on that and use biological controls. Biological controls are, I guess you, um, I'm struggling to think if, if we can classify them as organic, but they're definitely much more sustainable products. Um, with the biological controls, um, the important thing is you have to apply them at a very early stage. They're not going to help you once you've got population explosions of, you know, spider mites and various insects and such. Um, so with the biological controls, you have to really be monitoring and get on top of the problem um, before it, it blows up. And then the other thing to think about is drip irrigation. Um, drip irrigation, very important. You don't want you don't want a sprinkler system. You don't want to be hand watering. With the drip irrigation, um, it's more sustainable because you're only you're not over irrigating, um, and also you're not getting uh, water droplets on your flowers. Now, I'm not a post-harvest expert, but just some simple tips for harvesting flowers. Um, harvest in the morning with the cut flowers. They are more hydrated in the morning hours, uh, more turgid and better quality versus in the afternoon. Now, you can use a sharp knife. Um, people in the trade like to use a knife. You can certainly use pruners, but you're more likely to crush the stem with pruners unless they're very sharp. Um, make sure the cut is made at a 45 degree angle and that facilitates the uptake of water and then place them immediately in a clean bucket of water. And the, the key word here is clean. That bucket should be so clean that you could drink out of it. If the bucket is dirty, if it has bacteria and fungi, um, that can clog up the vascular system of the flowers. Um, <clears throat> You can, you can um, make sure to store the flowers in a cooler and then research you know, some of the floral preservatives and hydrating solutions. There are rehydrating solutions that will you know, keep the vascular system clean. And there are floral preservatives that have sugar in them to, to provide carbohydrates to the flowers since they're no longer connected to the plant. This all helps lengthen the life of the cut flowers. The other thing to think about is whether your flowers are sensitive to ethylene. So ethylene is a, a gas that you don't see. It's an actual plant hormone. Um, it's what causes your apples in your refrigerator to go bad. It's, it's a, an odorless, colorless gas um, that can, can cause a problem with flowers. Notably, it causes a problem with Snapdragon. So people that are in the commercial trade will use STS or MCP1. Uh, these are ethylene blockers. STS is, is, is kind of frowned upon now because it uses, it does, it's a little bit more toxic because it um, has silver in it. So it has a heavy metal in it. Um, MCP1 is more expensive, but it's, it's used more frequently now because it's more sustainable than STS. If you're looking for a good book, um, I'd recommend Specialty Cut Flowers by Ellen Armitage and, and Judy Lauschman. So I've got an old edition. I don't know if it's been updated since then, but it's still just a wealth of knowledge about each genus of flower, um, you know, their growing requirements, their post-harvest storage requirements, and some of the cultivars that are out there.
Um, but also keep in mind that a lot a lot of information can be found online, um, you know, like through through the uh, through the various um, breeding the flower breeding companies like Ball. If you're thinking about doing high tunnel production, you don't have to buy a $10,000 high tunnel that's 30 feet wide and 96 feet long. You know, maybe try dabbling a bit with, um, with a smaller high tunnel. This happens to be the high tunnel at the 4-H camp in Washburn, North Dakota. Now they're growing vegetables in it and the plastic has been taken off because I took these pictures in summer. But this is like a $500 high tunnel and then they built a raised bed um, around it. So, you know, you can, you can think small if you wanted to start um, producing cut flowers in your backyard. All right, so I wanna leave you with this quote by Luther Burbank. Burbank, um, I, you may know Burbank is actually the name of one of our cultivars uh, of potatoes. But he said, flowers always make people better happier and more helpful. They are sunshine, food, and medicine for the soul. All right, so we just want to acknowledge um, our team, um, the High Value Crops team, Jacob Clusa, whose data I, I presented here, Kyla Splickle, and uh, Harleen Hatterman Valenti. All right, so I'll take questions. All right, you have several questions. Good. <laughs> Let me open up the chat box again. I am seeing where can I get more information on high tunnels for growing vegetables or fruits? Is there still a government program that provides funding for the high tunnels? Okay, so the first thing is information. Um, if you Google NDSU high tunnels, we do have a website that has um, several recordings on there regarding high tunnel production. So we do have an NDSU extension, you know, website, and it's just, it's got an archive of recordings, including, you know, how to construct a high tunnels, you know, variety trials, but also we had um, experts from other states that were plant pathologists and such that, that spoke on that. The other thing is University of Minnesota does have a high tunnel manual. Um, so Terry Nenich is a former extension educator with the University of Minnesota and he wrote a fabulous, fabulous manual on, on growing vegetables in high tunnels. So highly recommend that. Now, as far as funding, I, I guess I haven't looked within the past year, but historically there have been um, is it cost reimbursements for high tunnels? So the important thing is to contact um, USDA, your N USDA NRCS um, station in your, in your county or in your region, and they would have more information. Um, there are also loans available through FSA. I'm trying to remember what FSA stands for, but they, they work very closely with NRCS Federal Service Agency, federal, oh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on it, but they do have loans available too, and there might even be COVID loans. So good question. All right, next one. Did you have issues with deer getting into the field or garden? And if so, what would you recommend to guard against it? We did not have deer because, um, this was um, particularly for our Ab Soraka location, we do have an eight foot fence around it. So this is part of our horticultural research farm where the Dale Herman Arboretum is. So it's very important for us to protect that. We do have an eight foot fence around it. Um, so th that, that is definitely helpful. Now we did also have a, a short electric fence around um, the high tunnel and the outdoor field planting to try and deter some of the, the rabbits and, and raccoons. I think it pretty much kept the rabbits out. We did have problems with a wily old raccoon that would get into the high tunnel. No matter what we did, he, he figured out that electric fence or he, I don't know, I, he was able to get in or maybe it was a she, I don't know. Um, so yes, there, there are always problems, but fencing is the best way. I mean, particularly if you've got um, 
a crop, you know, there's definitely different ways of fencing that are more economical than doing a big eight foot fence. But um, if you're gonna grow commercially, you do have to protect the crop. And I'll add one thing in the Food Safety Modernization Act, there's a whole section on deterring wildlife. So if you go to the Cornell FISMA materials, you can find a lot more. All right, you've got several more questions. How much earlier does the high tunnel soil warm up compared to field soil? And what was the average soil temperature difference during the spring thaw? Okay, um, we saw about three to four week difference in the warm up of it. And I don't remember the average soil temperature during the spring thaw. I'd have to go back to our, our data to see the differences, the difference there between the, the high tunnel and the field. We did, we did collect that data. I just haven't looked at it for a long period of time, but yeah, three to four week difference is what we saw. Next question, did you apply any fertilizer or feed during the growing season to any of the plants? Um, the fertilizer, it was a granular fertilizer that was applied at the beginning of the season and incorporated into the soil. Um, and I think we might've done a little bit of fertigation through the irrigation line too. So we did both. So fertigation is where you apply, you know, liquid fertilizer through the, the irrigation, um, the irrigation system. But it was predominantly by um, the granular fertilizer. I don't remember, I don't remember which fertilizer we used. We did use one that had more calcium in it. And just so everybody knows, if you're not following the chat box, the high tunnel publication link is in the chat. And the next question, I struggled with aphids on my flowers in the high tunnel. Are they more likely to come when ventilation is poor? Um, I don't know about the ventilation, but they do come in through, you know, gaps in the high tunnel and when they're vented. We, we are seeing more and more high tunnel producers that are putting in a fine mesh or a fine screen over the vents to prevent the aphids from coming in. Um, that's particularly recommended because some of our aphids can come from, you know, surrounding farmland and such. Um, but yes, we, we do see problems with aphids and aphids can also vector, you know, diseases and diseases and such. So very important to get on top of that. There are definitely, um, there, there are some biological controls that can be used. Um, so look up aphids and biological controls or else, I mean, you, you might have to use a, a pesticide, which is unfortunate. Um, but it, it is a problem when you have the vents that are open and um, they, they really do seem to like flowers is what we discovered. And we have another question. Can you explain sulfur burners and do you recommend a fungicide? Okay, um, sulfur burners, um, so with the sulfur burner, it, it releases sulfur into the air. And we see this a lot with commercial greenhouse production. And, and now you don't wanna be going, going in there when it does, does this, but it, it does release some sulfur into the air and um, the acidity of the, the sulfur um, prevents powdery mildew. So it's, it's quite effective um, and it's also considered organic. Um, so sulfur is, is a good thing. Um, fungicides, now you have to look at, at the bottle to make sure that it's labeled for you know, ornamentals and whatnot, but just, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, chlorothalonil is one, we, one that we recommend for a lot of different things, but you might also wanna check out microbutanil, which is um, a fungicide. Um, that may be better for powdery mildew. But, um, you know, I hate to give fungicide recommendations, you know, without looking up, you know, the fungicide label and making sure that it's labeled for specific crops. Okay, and now we have one with a couple of acronyms and I'm not sure what they mean. <laughs> um, right now, BC, I assume that's British Columbia, is having problems with enough workers to harvest daffodils since SA employees aren't able to get there. Do we have daffodil production fields here? And do you recommend the burning of stem ends for preservation? 
Okay, um, so I'm assuming you're talking about South African workers not being able to come to the United States because of the variant. And I'm not aware of large scale daffodil production in North Dakota. It wouldn't surprise me because daffodils do wonderfully well for us here. Um, and I would have to look up um, what the whether burning the stem end would help with daffodil. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head whether that's a good thing. I do know you don't want to store daffodils with other flowers. Daffodils have a, a chemical that actually will um, um, will age the other flowers if you store them with them. So I know that daffodils do need to be stored separately. And it's South America. We just had a clarification, not okay. South Africa. So. I didn't know either. <laughs> I mean, I, I've seen I've seen both, you know, both in the uh, both as being, you know, farm workers here in North Dakota. Um, and one of our attendees says that they have had success with neem spray and dealing with powdery mildew. Just have to make sure you spray it at dusk or dawn so you don't get the the beneficials. Mm -hmm. So just a comment. Yeah, yep, that's a good one. And neem works for both both insects and, and diseases. So this is one that's um, um, derived from the, the neem tree, um, or azadiractin is, is the, the name of the tree. Mm -hmm. I think that's all the questions that I see. So I just wanna thank you, Esther. It was so great to see all these beautiful flowers and maybe someday again, we will have flowers in North Dakota. <laughs> I hope soon. So thank you very much for your presentation and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.